Thank you. Thank you, Reb Shmuley. Bethel is very, very pleased to be a co-host for today's event. And thank you, Reb Shmuley, for your wonderful work at um, providing amazing continuing education for Jewish adults here and um, events that impact and inform our lives. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know, Beth L. is the only egalitarian conservative shul in Central Phoenix. Uh, we are open for socially distanced Shabbat services now. We provide two daily minyanim uh, for whatever your needs might be. And we also have several learning opportunities as well this summer. Please visit us at www.bethelphoenix.com for more information. Without further free plugging, it's my honor to introduce Sarit Katan Gribitz. Um, Dr. Sarit Katan Gribitz is Associate Professor in the Theology Department at Fordham University. She's Acting Director of Fordham's Center for Jewish Studies, and she is a student at Yeshivat Maharat. Her first book, Time and Difference in Rabbinic Judaism, received a National Jewish Book Award in scholarship, and she's currently working on her next book, which sounds fabulous, by the way, entitled Jerusalem, A Feminist History. I can't wait to read that. Um, Sarit's presentation is called, What Does God Do All Day Long? Rabbinic Reflections of the Divine Daily Schedule. I cannot wait to learn about this topic because I've been wanting to schedule God in for conversation and coffee down at my local Starbucks. So I'm really excited to see how that's gonna happen. Sarit, please. Just one word, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, the format for today will be about 35 to 45 minutes of presentation, followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of, Q of Q and A. So yes, thank you so much, Wendy, and welcome, Professor. Um, thank you so much. So I, I wanna start by thanking uh, Rabbi Shalik Lewis and Pam and everyone at Valley Beit Midrash and Beth L for the kind invitation to share some of my research with all of you um, and to Wendy for um, such a warm introduction. Um, I have admired the work that VBM has been doing and excited to participate in it today. Um, and of course, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to learn together with me. I hope that the class will be engaging and interactive. So um, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll answer them either as I go or during our discussion at the end. I'm really looking forward to our time together. Speaking of time, uh, have you ever wondered what goes on at this hour in the heavens? In their book, The Daily Life of the Greek Gods, Julia Sisa and Marcel Detien write about the questions that Cicero, Lucian, Seneca, and other ancient Roman writers and philosophers asked about their gods. And this is what they write. What do they do? Or more to the point, do they do anything at all? For, as Cicero remarks, much is said about what they look like and the places where they live and about their houses and the exploits of their lives. But the question that above all underlies any difference of opinion as to their nature is whether or not they do anything, meddle in anything, abstain from all concern and all cares. Whatever would one do with carefree and passive gods of leisure? The question of their activity was the touchstone for their presence in the world. The stakes to answers about how gods organize and use their time are enormous. The topic interested the ancient rabbis for the same reasons it occupied others in the ancient world. Rabbis sought to understand how their gods relate to human beings and the world that they inhabit, how their gods' actions impinge on human existence, and whether gods' existence matters at all for those who live on earth. <clears throat> 
imagining how God's time is divided and what God does during each hour of each day also allowed the rabbis to grapple with the question of what distinguishes divine from human, as well as to differentiate themselves from those who lived around them. I recently published a book titled Time and Difference in Rabbinic Judaism, which examines conceptions and organizations of time and rabbinic sources from both Palestine and Babylonia. And the underlying contention of the book is that time is culturally constructed, historically contingent, and disciplinarily specific. That is that the very basic assumptions we make about time are not, not natural nor universal, but they're products of the societies and the communities in which we live even when they seem natural or biological because they're bound up with natural processes such as the rising and the setting of the sun, the phases of the moon, the changing of the seasons, the aging of our bodies and so on. And units of time such as years and months and weeks and hours and days, as well as our experiences of those units and the experience of time's passage more generally are constructed. And also the way in which we divide time and use time is not arbitrary. It's the opposite. It reveals our deepest societal and individual values because how we choose to organize and spend our time is a reflection of what we value. I submitted my book manuscript for publication in February of 2020 in a world very different from the one in which we find ourselves today. And that world pre-pandemic was one in which the constructedness of time was not obvious to anyone aside from the few of us who work on the history of time. How many of us, for example, contemplated the fact that the seven day week was not the way that most people divided their time in antiquity or that dividing the day into standard hours is a relatively recent phenomenon. But in March, 2020, as soon as cities shut down, routines were uprooted and we began counting in cycles of daily virus counts, weekly testing averages and two week quarantines, we all became urgently aware of the constructedness of time. In its first pandemic issue, which you see here, the New Yorker magazine's cover featured Eric Drucker's depiction of an empty Grand Central terminal with its iconic clock in the center and a lone figure sweeping up. The image beautifully captures in my mind the sense of uncertainty and fear, especially in New York where I live, as we all ventured into an unknown time. Time slowed or stopped for those who were asked to stay home, and it sped up for those who worked around the clock to care for the sick or to maintain our cities. Um, and now, as cities um, open back up in the US and traffic is picking up and the pace of life is slowly returning, we all have an acute awareness that time is anything but inevitable. Because of the pandemic and how it brought time into central focus for so many people, um, I no, no longer need to persuade people that time is culturally constructed and historically contingent, nor that time matters for who we are and how we live, nor that to understand any society past or present, we have to examine that society's conceptions and organizations of time. And in my book, I argue that the rabbis of antiquity used timekeeping and discourses about time to construct social, political, and theological difference. And I highlight four examples that they distinguished between what it meant to be rabbinic and what it meant to be Roman, um, what it meant to be Jewish and what it meant to be Christian, what it meant to be uh, a man and what it meant to be a woman, and what it meant to be human and what it meant to be divine, right? And so time serves as a powerful mechanism through which to enact difference and to forge identity, right? So put very simply, time is used to create community and also to construct difference, right? So a group of people who follows the same calendar or celebrates the same holiday becomes a community through that practice. And a group who uses a different calendar or deliberately abstains from participating in certain holidays differentiates itself from those who, who, who use the main calendar. And the topic that I want to explore today is about rabbinic conceptions of divine time, and specifically the question of 
what ancient sources imagine to be God's daily schedule and nightlife. The texts ask, how does God spend time? What does God do with so many hours in each day? And how, through thinking about God's time, do the rabbis conceive of what it meant to be human and what it meant to be divine? The question of what God, sorry, the question of whether God exists in time and how divine time relates to human time animated the theological work of many ancient thinkers. The first century Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, for example, argued in his treatise on the creation of the world that in contrast to people and all other creations, God exists out of time and that this timeless aspect of the divine is a central feature that distinguishes between human and, and divine. So according to Philo, time was created simultaneously with material creation, that time didn't pre-exist matter. And so God is both eternal and atemporal, and the created world and all of its inhabitants are temporally bound. So in this account, Philo argues not only that God exists outside of time, but to be divine is to be eternal and atemporal, right? That the, that the temporality of God and humans is what makes them human and divine. It constitutes their difference. So especially in light of ancient sources such as these, it's striking that in rabbinic sources, which we're gonna to turn to right now, um, about human and divine time, humans and God exist in the same time and, um, and, and very, very much so. So in our time together today, I wanna to explore a number of playful rabbinic texts that um, address the following questions. Um, and I've divided them into five units. The first asks, how did God spend each hour of the sixth day of the world's creation? The second, how, what has God been doing since creation, right? Like there's so much free time. Um, how are God's days organized and how does God abide by an hourly schedule? Um, hopefully after this section, Wendy will know exactly when to schedule her coffee with God. Um, how does God experience emotions or undertake activities at other times of the day? Um, does God use time in ways that human beings use time or in ways that um, are unique to God? And then finally, how does God divide the night um, and what are God's nocturnal activities? The first text that I want to look at together um, comes from uh, Leviticus Rabbah. Um, it's actually a narrative that appears in many different rabbinic sources, including Sikta Darav Kahana, <coughs> the Babylonian Talmud, and Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. Um, and each of these narratives describes each hour of the sixth day um, of creation. So let's have a look here. The text says, and this I'm going to read the, the bolded part. Thus, you are left to conclude that on the first of Tishrei, Adam was created, right? So we know um, Adam was created on the sixth day of creation. In the first hour, the idea of creating a person occurred to God. Right? So first, God thought of the idea of creating a person. In the second, God took counsel with the ministering angels. Right, so this refers to a, an, a widespread rabbinic tradition in which God um, first has an idea of creation, and this goes back to Platonic ideas of sort of having an idea before an actual form. Um, and then God um, is unsure if it's a good idea, and he, God consults with the angels. Um, in the rabbinic Midrashim, the angels actually warn God not to create people, uh, but God does it anyways. In the third hour, God needed Adam, um, meaning started physically creating the first human. In the fourth, God shaped him. In the fifth, God made Adam into a lifeless body. In the sixth, God breathed a soul into Adam. In the seventh, God stood him on his feet. In the eighth, God brought him into the Garden of Eden. In the ninth, he was commanded not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And in the 10th, Adam transgressed, in the 11th was judged, and in the 12th, pardoned. 
So here we have sort of a storyboard, um, a, day, a schedule of that sixth day of creation. Um, and we learn um, everything that happens. Of course, this is very different from the biblical story in which much else happens on the sixth day, not least that Eve is created and that there are certain animals that are created and so on. Um, but what it does is it focuses God's sixth day of creation on the on the idea and the act of creating human beings. One interesting piece um, to note in this narrative is that God's actions are the subjects in the first nine hours, right? God thinks about creating Adam, consults the angels, creates Adam. And then there, the narrative shifts so that the subject is now Adam rather than God. And that's when Adam is commanded, transgresses, is judged, and pardons. So we see this transition from the human to, sorry, from the divine to the human on the sixth day of creation. What purpose did the story serve? Um, the, the narrative appears in um, Leviticus Rabbah, and it's a comment on the passage in Leviticus that commands the, the people of Israel to celebrate a holiday on the seventh month, on the first day of that month. Um, today, we know that uh, holiday as Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, um, but it is not called Rosh Hashanah in the Bible. And so the rabbinics um, the biblical commentary wants to know, like, why, why do we have to celebrate this holiday? Like, what happened? What momentous thing happened on this day such that it is a Yom Tov, so, such that it is a, a holiday? And the answer is that God started creating the world on the 25th of Elul, um, and so that the sixth day of creation falls out on the first day of the seventh month, and that one of the things that is celebrated on Rosh Hashanah is the creation of Adam or of humanity. Um, it's interesting, right, that um, it's not only the start of the calendar year, um, but it also is the anniversary of God's creation of the first human being. And, and this is what's uh, um, the central component, is that it is the day on which God judges every human being, right? So it's, um, it's not only the creation, but it's also the day on which Adam sins and Adam is forgiven. And here we have a story um, that explains that this holiday, Rosh Hashanah, is a holiday in which humans sort of recultivate that relationship to God on an annual basis and also seek repentance and are forgiven by God. This is um, an, an element of the story that, um, that also appears in Psikta de Rav Kahana, which tells the same narrative, um, but does so in a homily, um, like a sermon that was given on Rosh Hashanah. So here we see how a, an interpretation of a biblical verse gets incorporated into a rabbi's sermon to explain the, the significance of, um, of a holiday. This isn't the, the only um, set of sources in which this schedule appears. Um, we have, um, for example, a piyut, a liturgical poem from a synagogue that doesn't give the entire schedule of the sixth day of creation, but says that in the 12th hour, meaning in the last hour before sunset, um, God um, forgives Adam and it, it recalls the same rabbinic tradition. But instead of associating Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, with a time of repentance, it associates Erev Shabbat, sort of the, the, the moment in which Shabbat begins, as a weekly time in which the relationship between God and humans is rekindled and God um, forgives humans for their sins. There are two other versions of the story um, that appear in the Babylonian Talmud um, and elsewhere that have a very different feel to them. And in this version of the story, the sixth day of creation still has 12 hours. And in the first half of the day, God creates Adam hour by hour. But we get also the creation of Eve and the birth of um, Adam and Eve's sons. Um, and then also the command not to eat from the tree and the sin. But instead of that day being a day of forgiveness, that day becomes the day on which Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden 
and God is angry at them. And so what happens in this story is that it flips from being a story about the, the tight relationship that God and people have and sort of the cycle of sin and forgiveness and becomes instead a story about sin and punishment. Um, and it's a, a much darker version of the story. We could, of course, spend our entire time together looking at this story, um, but we, we won't do that. I, I want to um, note, though, that this um, set of narratives about the sixth day of creation existed in the rabbinic sort of literary corpus in a much larger context as well. And that's in a Christian context in which also um, um, texts from the region, including Syriac and Greek texts, also wondered what God did during um, the, the sixth day of creation and mapped the sixth day of the creation onto another very important Friday in the history of Christianity, and that's the crucifixion of Jesus, which in the Gospels also is mapped onto an hourly, not, not every hour, but certain specific hours of the day, um, and that um, the sixth day of creation becomes a, a sort of prefiguration of the sin of Adam that then is redeemed by, by Jesus on the sixth day of the week during the crucifixion. And so here we see the Jewish and the Christian interacting with one another. The rabbinic sources make it about Rosh Hashanah and this annual day of repentance or about Friday Eve before the Sabbath as a weekly day of repentance. And the same sort of narrative is used to talk about the crucifixion as a redemptive moment for other communities. So this story sort of exists in this complicated um, uh, situation. Now that we know exactly what God did during the sixth day of creation, um, we could wonder what has God been doing since then? And to answer that question, I wanna turn to um, a well-known text that, um, that appears um, also in an Amoraic Midrash, um, and that is a story about Matrona, um, a Roman woman. I um, mean, there's a lot of discussion in the literature about um, what is the identity of um, this Roman woman. Um, maybe she's um, maybe she's a Roman pagan. Maybe she's um, a, an educated Roman rabbinic woman. Um, in all cases, she approaches a rabbi um, in this version of the story that I have here in Leviticus Rabbites, Rabbi Yossi ben Chalufta. And, um, and she, she asks the rabbi, um, excuse me, but um, I understand that God was very busy during the first six days of creation, but what in the world has God been doing since then? Um, and the rabbi answers um, and he senses Matrona's um, sort of um, suspicion about how God um, might not know how to manage time so well. And says, actually God, um, has been making matches, um, like he's been a matchmaker um, since then. And <clears throat> Matrona is not convinced. And, and she says, well, that's really easy. I have lots of, I, I enslave lots of people. Um, why don't I just show you how I can do it um, in, in a very short amount of time? And actually the, the time unit she uses is Sha'a which in rabbinic sources means either like a small portion of the day or an hour. And she takes all the people she's enslaved and she matches them up. And then the next day they come to her and they're bruised and they're fighting and they're traumatized and they're extremely angry at her. And what she realizes through this experience is that um, the fact that God has been spending all this time matchmaking in heaven is because matchmaking is really hard. And, for anyone who's ever tried to make a match, um, I think um, we can agree that it's not easy work. Um, and that's sort of her moment of acknowledging um, sort of that God is spending time um, really intimately caring for the individual needs of all human beings um, and, 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 and so on. And, and that's, that's the story. Um, what I think is so interesting about this story is if you think about God's work during creation, God has two tasks. God, on the one hand, creates all of the creations. And then on the other hand, God also matches, right? Um, and we see that in the story. Adam 
um, when Adam is created, God asks Adam to find a match and Adam can't find a match. And so God creates Eve, right? That's the story. And here, what we get the sense of is that what God has been doing since creation is actually sustaining the order of creation itself, um, that God is continues to make matches. Um, the, we can sort of place this story in its um, broader historical and geographical context as well. Um, this is a time when um, creationism was um, one way of understanding um, the world and how it sustained this idea of a creator who then sort of lets the world operate um, at, on its own. Um, and maybe even Matrona is a Roman with that kind of philosophical orientation who then um, is told that actually no, God sustains all the people um, in this particular way. Since then, it's also a time in which asceticism um, and celibacy becomes more popular among Christians living in, in the region of the Galilee um, and, and the Levant. And here, one of the things that God does with all of the time since creation is create marriages. Um, and so you, you have a sense also of the ways in which the rabbis are imagining God's time very much also in conversation with those around them. But regardless of like the polemical or, or the apologetic undertones of the story, what we get is a sense of God's devotion to the well-being and the reproduction of humanity, right? God devotes all of God's time to making sure that humans are happy with one another and that they can sustain themselves uh, in, in, in the way that the story works. The idea that God spends all day or a portion of the day making matches um, in heaven appears in a number of sources, not only um, in the story about Matrona. Um, and here I have a source um, from the fragment Targum, one of the Targumim, but it's actually a a story, like a, a schedule of God's day that appears in all of the Palestinian Midrashim, um, though not in, um, in Unculus. Um, and that is an interpretation, a translation of a passage from Deuteronomy um, in which Moses goes up to heaven and um, Moses learns that God, God's work is perfect. And the question is like, what does God do all day that it's perfect? And, and we, we learn that one of the things that Moses learns when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai is uh, what God does all day long. And what does God do all day long? Well, um, God has 12 hours in a day and those hours are divided um, into blocks of time, blocks of three hours. So God first studies Torah, then God judges the world, then God provides um, the world, sustains the world um, with food and other things. And then God makes matches between humans and um, uh, be between men and women in the story, right? So this idea of, it's not that God spends all of the time uh, making matches, but God spends a good portion of the time making matches. This is, um, to me, interesting because this is a text that would have been recited in the synagogue um, alongside the Torah reading for people to understand in the local Aramaic dialect um, that people understood often better than they did in the Hebrew. And so in the translation of, um, of this Torah portion, they would have learned God's schedule. But God's schedule also comes to play a role in ritual um, texts. So here is a poem that's um, an Aramaic wedding poem that we could imagine was recited either on the Sabbath leading up to a wedding or during a wedding celebration itself or in the days celebrating the wedding thereafter. And the poem describes how God makes perfect matches for three hours each day. Um, and God binds the grooms and the brides together with, with wedding crowns. Um, so this is a poem. Uh, it's a fascinating poem that essentially tells the couple that's celebrating their wedding that they are a match made in heaven, literally. Um, and that in order to um, sort of sanctify that wedding, they need to do, um, like they need to act according to God's laws. So it has this um, like celebratory, but also um, like pedagogical function, right? Do what God um, commands because God um, spent time um, creating matches. And, and in fact, there are lots of traditions in, um, in rabbinic sources, including in Genesis Rabbah, where 
God uh, adorns Eve on the sixth day of creation and braids Eve's hair um, and, and all sorts of things so that she's ready for her wedding day. And here the poem sort of invokes those traditions and says that God does that for each couple. There's another version of this story um, or of this divine schedule that appears in the Babylonian Talmud. Um, and in that version, actually, God does not make matches, but God has a different daily schedule. Um, this, this text appears in a longer homily that's about um, the nations of the world in Israel. Um, but in this, um, in this portion of it, the question is, what does God do all day long? And we hear that God um, first studies Torah, then judges the world, um, then feeds the world. And finally, in the fourth hour of the day, God laughs with the Leviathan. Um, so much of the schedule is similar to the traditions that we already looked at. Um, but I started wondering as I was doing my research about um, why does God spend three hours of each day with the Leviathan? Um, and what I realized is that in rabbinic sources, um, the Leviathan is created on, in, during the week of creation. Um, and the Leviathan um, was created in a pair, just like um, all the other creatures except for that the Leviathan posed an existential threat to the world because the Leviathan is a sea monster and is one of the figures in the ancient Near East um, and in, um, in rabbinic tradition that um, was so powerful that it could destroy the created world. And so in rabbinic traditions, um, God is anxious that if there are two leviathans and they're able to have babies, then the world, the oceans will be populated by leviathans and soon the world will be destroyed. And so what does God do? God um, slays the female leviathan and pickles her for uh, the feast of the eschaton. And, um, and so there's only one leviathan left. Um, and at the end of the sixth day of creation, everyone is paired up, all the animals and all the fish and, and everything, um, including Adam, who now has Eve, um, except for God. God is this solitary figure, and the only solitary figure left is the Leviathan. And God and the Leviathan play this really important role in the creation of the world, um, but have nothing to do until the eschatological end of the world. And so God and the Leviathan are both lonely and they spend time together each day. And there's this interesting verb that's used, schok, um, or schok, laughter, frolicking. God and Le the Leviathan frolic together um, during the last part of each day. Um, this too is a tradition that is more widespread than just the Babylonian Talmud. There's, um, there's a midrash um, uh, that's somewhat later that incorporates this idea that God spends time each day with a Leviathan um, in Eliyahu Rabbah. And in that version of the story, God doesn't spend three hours of the day with a Leviathan, but God spends one hour of the day with a Leviathan. And God tells each person who dies, I spent my time wisely. I spent a third of my day reading and studying the Torah, a third of the day judging people, a third of the day um, doing charity, staka, and sustaining the world and feeding all of its creatures. And I only left one hour at the end of my day for leisure, for schok, um, each day. So he, uh, God doesn't identify Leviathan as, as the, the creature with whom God um, plays. But the idea is God didn't waste time in inconsequential things. Um, and then God turns to the deceased and says, how did you spend your time? Um, and here what we see is that God's schedule is used in order to convince people to use their time well and to align the way they use each hour of each day with their values. Um, the, the Babylonian source about God's daily schedule um, also includes um, uh, pushback. Um, one source says God 
can't possibly be laughing with the Leviathan every day because there's a tradition that says that God hasn't laughed since the destruction of the temple. And so an alternative is suggested that God used to laugh with the Leviathan until the destruction of the temple. And now after the destruction, God teaches, God becomes um, a, a teacher, an educator, a pedagogue um, in heaven for all the children who are in heaven. Um, and so there's this, also this sense that there isn't only God during creation and God after creation, but there's also God before and after the destruction and that God adjusts God's schedule in light of um, the world's events. There's also, um, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll um, well, there, there are traditions that wonder what God does um, at other points in the day. And I'll, I'll just mention three very briefly. One is the idea that God gets angry every day, um, but God gets angry for a split second every day. And it's always in the first three hours of the day. Um, it's such a short amount of time that humans can't predict it, right? So there's this like wild card that you don't want to piss God off. Um, God gets angry every day, but it's so fleeting. Um, and in one source, uh, God gets angry every day in the first three hours of the day, because that's when the nations of the world um, worship the sun. So there's also this sense of some competition. And of course, hours and the sun are intimately related with one another because daytime hours are based on the sun's movement across the sky. Um, another, um, and that, well, before I, I go here, um, I'll say um, there's also a, a text, a very famous story called the Avinaf Achnai, um, in which, um, for our intents and purposes, it doesn't matter what happens, but the rabbis get in, themselves into trouble in the study house, and then um, they turn to Elijah and ask, what is God doing in the heavens at this time? And Elijah says, God is laughing. Um, and so this idea also that God coordinates like the, the responses, God has responses to things that happen on earth simultaneously with when they're happening. So even though God has a schedule, God is also very spontaneous in being able to react to things on earth um, as they happen. And lastly, God puts phylacteries on every morning to be lean. Um, and so God, so God observes the time bound commandments. Um, and the tefillin in particular are ways of, in which God um, communicates God's love for Israel, right? So here we have anger, we have laughter or amusement, and we have love. Um, and so sort of interspersed into God's days are sort of these bursts of emotion that relate to human action. And then there's the question of what God does at night. Um, and what's really interesting here um, is a continuation of the story from the Bavli about God's daily schedule. And in this, um, in, in, in this story, we have a very, very clear sense of what God does during each hour each day. But when it comes to the night, what we learn is that it's much less clear. And the, the Agadah says, um, sorry, this is not the right source. This is the right source. Um, it, it says, well, you might say that God does the same thing as during the day, or maybe God rides through the heavens, or maybe God participates um, in the songs of the angels. And there's a stark contrast between the certainty of God's time during the day and the uncertainty of God's time during the night. And the night becomes a sort of mysterious time that, that the rabbis aren't really sure what God does during the, the night. And so it balances between sort of knowing God and knowing what God is up to and also not knowing what, what God is up to. One text that does um, know one of the things that God does at night is that God roars. Um, there's an interesting backstory to this source. But what I want to highlight here is that each um, night is divided into watches, the same way that the daytime is divided into units of time so that it's four sections of three hours. The nighttime is also divided um, into sections. And this rabbinic um, tradition explains that God roars at the end of each of the watches. And the question is, why does God roar? And the answer is that God roars because God is mourning the destruction of the temple, right? So God, in a way, has insomnia. Anxiety keeps God up at night, and he mourns um, much in the way that humans might mourn after a tragedy um, at night. 
Um, and so we have a sense of even at night when we don't exactly know what God does with each hour, one of the things that God does is care about what happens to um, the people of Israel um, in, um, in Jerusalem and, and on earth more, more generally. Um, I want to wrap up the, the formal part of my remarks with um, a number of observations. Um, what conclusions can we draw from the sources um, that we examine today? Um, so for, for the rabbis, humans and God reckon time according to uh, the same units of time, right? God has days and hours and wa nighttime watches and um, in other sources also midnight and, and other subdivisions of the day. Um, but also, um, so in that way, God and humans are connected. But also God does things during that time that mimic what people do, whether it's matchmaking or feeding or judging or studying Torah, but in a way that is a perfect management of time and on a scale um, that is very different. And so we get this sense of God connects to humans through these, these time units, but also sort of keeps enough of a distance to remain divine and not human. Um, a second observation is that the, the sources about God's daily schedule, whether in creation or after creation, appear in rabbinic sources, both from Palestine and from Babylonia, from the Amoraic period and later, so from the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries um, onward, in a many different kinds of texts, in exegetical texts, so biblical interpretation, in polemical sources, in ritual sources, in mystical contexts, um, in homilies, in liturgical poems. So we get the sense that um, these were not very niche ideas, but they circulated widely. They were preached in the synagogues and other communal settings on the Sabbath, on holidays, during life cycle events. And they weren't sort of confined to the esoteric exclusive um, realm of um, the rabbinic study house. And it's um, people in my field often discuss um, the question of why theological questions aren't more prominent in rabbinic sources. Um, and I think that what we can see here is even though theology itself might not have been at the center of the rabbinic enterprise, it was at the heart of the intersection between the rabbinic project and popular piety, right? It's at those moments, the sermon in the synagogue or the liturgical poem um, where the, the ideas of, um, of, of rabbinic interpretation and, um, and everyday life sort of met. Um, I also think that it's worth highlighting, um, and this is the, the third point of conclusion, that if, um, if these sources were incorporated into um, any aspect of synagogue life, then um, they, were, um, they were recited or shared in synagogues that had likely um, zodiac mosaics on their floors. Um, so here you see three from um, Tveria, from Sipori, and from Beit Alpha, um, but there are many um, zodiacs all, all over the Galilee. Um, and, um, and what the, the zodiac is, is a depiction of time. We have 12 months um, around the circle. We have four um, personifications of the seasons at each of the corners. And we have Helios, um, the sun god right in the middle. And so we have the annual cycle of the months, we have the annual cycle of the seasons, and in the middle, what we have is God who governs both the solar year but also the hours of each day. And so um, we have a God who's present in the synagogue at all hours of the day. And importantly, there are also stars and the moon in the middle. And so not only during the day, but also at night, and the, the stars were, were used to, um, to tell nighttime hours as the constellations moved across the sky. And so we have a, a God that is depicted in the synagogue itself as being present always in the same way that God is present in these sources always to care for human needs. Um, a couple final points of conclusion. Um, 
in the two narratives. So um, God um, spends a lot of time caring for humanity um, and, uh, and also special time caring for the people of Israel in particular. So we have God cares for creatures writ large, God cares for humans, and God cares for Israel. And we see it reflected in the way that God spends time. Um, God also mourns the destruction of the temple specific to Israel. Um, and finally, um, rabbinic narratives about God's time not only provide answers to what God does each day, but also how God divides time each day. Um, so we, we also know that God uses an hourly schedule, which might seem obvious to us, but was actually a relatively new way of dividing time in this region of the world. Hours originated in Egypt, um, a, a couple millennia BCE, um, and um, were incorporated in, in various contexts in the Hellenistic world. But it was the Roman Empire that brought hours to the region of Palestine. Um, and it was associated in particular with Roman imperialism and with a Roman emperor who stamped his letters with not only the date, um, but also the hour um, that the letters were sent um, and became sort of a status symbol, a symbol of privilege. Um, being punctual meant that you were powerful. And so here we see God, God's punctuality and use of time is also a display of divine power. Um, and the rabbinic sources um, also explain that in order to connect to God, um, one ought to use one's time well. And that's um, part of the whole discourse of Bitul Torah and, um, and Bitul Beit Midrash, this idea of not wasting um, Torah or not wasting time in the Beit Midrash, that devoting all possible time to Torah study became synonymous with not wasting time in, in later rabbinic traditions. Um, and, and we have all sorts of sayings in rabbinic sources about how much God um, wants people to devote um, hours of their day or to make um, set times for learning and so on as a way to connect to God. So it's not only that God uses time to care for humanity, um, but also that, that people um, have the ability to make decisions about how they spend their time that allows them to connect to God. And so the question of what God does all day is fundamentally a question about how the world operates. Is there a divinity keeping order and watching out for the world? Um, it's a question about the world as much as or even more than about God. And so the, the texts that we looked at today um, are among my favorite rabbinic sources because yes, they're playful and weird and quirky. Um, it's not every day that you learn that God uh, hangs out with the Leviathan, um, but beneath the whimsical surface, they're really surprisingly insightful and they address profound theological questions about how the world operates, God's place in the world and how the human and divine spheres interact. So I'll stop amazing. there and I will- Amazing, amazing. Professor Sarika Tangrevitz, this is so amazing. The sources are great. The ideas are fascinating. Um, we want to open up for questions. I'm going to take the license to ask the first, but hopefully we can squeeze in a few here in the next 11 minutes. And my first is, if God made a blog post today, God was a blogger and had a divine polemic, a critique of the modern American and how they use their time. We know what God wants to do with, with her time um, as an ideal, but as a critique of the modern of the modern person, what do you think would be on the top of that list, based on these sources? Oh, that's a great question. What would God critique? I, so, so one of the things um, that I will say that seems like a very methodological sort of technical point, but but is important as I try to answer this question, is that I. I'm so careful when I talk about these sources to not say that God's time is modeled on human time, right? Because I don't think that that's what the rabbis say they are doing. And yet also God's time is very much a reflection of sort of rabbinic ideals about the way that time should be spent. So in a way your question is asking me what I think 
um, people should do with their time and then put it into God's um, voice. Um, but I think what, one of the things just working with rabbinic sources is that um, at least in the rabbinic sources that are about God's schedule is that God spends the first three hours of every day learning Torah, um, meaning studying, like asking questions, listening, wondering before acting. Um, I think that's a really interesting um, point of view. It's not that God spends all time act, um, studying, right? But God spends enough time to sort of have a, a grasp of the world's problems. And then the second thing that God does is God judges. Um, and, and there's a, a really interesting sort of diversion in the Babylonian source, which says that God um, sits on the seat of judgment um, and, or justice, um, and then realizes that if God was going to use justice, um, God would have to destroy the world. And so God gets up and plays musical chairs and sits on the seat of mercy. And so I think the second thing that God might write in a blog post is that in the way that we act and treat other people, we need to constantly sort of be navigating between justice and mercy um, and sort of interrogating what we do rather than just acting. Um, and then the third is feeding the creatures. And I think it's striking that God um, feeds not only humans, but all creatures. And the Babylonian source is very particular, like from the, like from the bugs to the buffalo. Um, and so um, God, like God is generous in that way and indiscriminately generous in a way. And then God takes care of people or takes time like self-care with the Leviathan. Um, so I think, I think what God might say is um, figure out what your values are and then act according to those values. Okay, great. We have a question from Rabbi Miriam and then Lauren. Okay, thank you so much. This is fascinating. I'm actually teaching a series um, in, in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw about uh, time. And the last class, which I'm teaching on Tuesday, uh, on Wednesday, sorry, is about Tisha B'Av and time in that context. And I was wondering where God was on 17 Tammuz and Tisha B'Av. So that's, that's a great question. And I think it's that question that underlies a lot of these questions about what God is doing now. It's like this theological question of like, was God absent um, or was this God's plan that the temple be destroyed? Um, I think that there are different ways that rabbinic sources answer that. Um, two of the ways are in the sources that I shared today. A third is um, in um, Lamentations Rabbah, um, in which there's, I think, also grappling, like God is, God, God the, the question of what is God doing, doing during the destruction is not discussed at length, but what is God doing immediately after the destruction? And there's one Midrash in which God doesn't know how to mourn, like God's never done it before. Um, and so God needs to ask humans, like, how, how do I mourn? What are the right um, rituals? Do I put sackcloth on myself? Do I remain silent? Do I cry out? And it's actually humans who help God figure out how to mourn the destruction of the temple. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways. Um, but I think um, one of the things that I argue in my book in the introduction is that I think much of rabbinic sources emphasis on daily time and like the present, like how are we supposed to act now and be Jewish now and sort of um, deferring the question of when redemption will happen and when um, the Messiah will come or when the temple will be rebuilt is because of the trauma of the destruction of the temple and the sense in which um, like we need to figure out what we do in this new era um, because it's so different. Um, and so one of the answers to that question is not to worry too much about the sort of distant future, but really to like find new ways of cultivating a relationship with God in the present. And that's where I think um, the emphasis on what, when is the right time to say the Shema and when is the right time to pray every day um, is really a, a question of 
how do we connect to God sort of on a, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, when we lost the way in which we used to do it with, with sacrifices? Like, how do we do it now? And so I think that shift to the quotidian it is sort of a, a much larger answer to the question of like, where was God? Where is God? That was fantastic. Thank you. Great, Lauren. Um, so my question is about God studying Torah. If Torah comes from God, God knows everything, God is infinite from the past to the future, why would God have to study Torah? Um, yeah, so isn't it so wonderful that for some reason there is no contradiction in that? Um, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, there, uh, the, the very beginning of Genesis Rava is about, um, it, it's an interpretation of Proverbs 8, and um, the idea is that God was with the Torah. The Torah was by God's side uh, when God created the world, so God used the Torah to create the world. Um, and yet God still needs to study. There's something really humbling about that, right? That even um, like even God um, can benefit from studying the Torah um, all the more so, right? Um, like people aren't um, beyond studying the Torah or, or whatever else it is um, that, that they need to make these big decisions um, uh, for the world. So I think you're right to point out that um, God either creates the Torah, dictates it to Moses, or um, God has a pre-existent Torah that God uses to create the world, and yet also God studies it. All those things are true simultaneously. Anyone else have a question? Okay, I'll throw the last one in then. What's the feminist critique? If, 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 if the rabbis were women who had written this, how would the schedule have looked different? Great question. Um, so I, I actually, um, I should know first that when I translate sources, I use the masculine God. Um, and when I talk about God, I talk about God without a gender. Um, so that, that I'm putting out there as um, just, um, a way of navigating the source of these stories, which is rabbinic, male, and masculinist sort of contexts, and also sort of trying to see their applicability beyond that context. Um, one of the sources in, um, in Bavli Brachot um, is about um, the last of God's nighttime roars. And it explains that God's roaring in heaven sort of reverberates in the world um, through different human and animal sounds. And the last of these sounds is a baby crying. And the baby is crying and that cry wakes the mother and the mother nurses the child and the nursing wakes the father and the father stands up and recites the Shema. So we have this, this sort of cycle or circle where like God does something that causes a baby to do something that causes a woman to do something, causes a man to do something that goes back to God. Um, and there's this idea of like everyone's on the same schedule, but they're doing different things at the same time. There are lots of things to point out about the story, but one of them is um, that the woman is actually nursing or sustaining her child. Um, so it's a very bodily um, act of sustaining the other. And the man is standing up and directing prayer to God, which is also a very embodied practice, um, but has um, like a, a reference that is divine rather than human. And I have a whole chapter in my book where I talk about um, gender and how, how um, rabbinic sources like create what it means to be a man and a woman in a rabbinic context and how that's very different. I think one of the important parts of answering this question is that discourse is about leisure and having control over one's time to decide how to spend one's time is a privileged position that in antiquity only free men would have had. And so one of the answers that the Yerushalmi gives to why women are not obligated in time-bound commandments is that they, like enslaved people and like children, don't have time 
um, they, they don't they don't have control over their time. And so how can they possibly make choices about their own time? So I think one feminist critique of, of this whole sort of discourse about how God spends time is that God's ability to decide how to use time um, is already a mark of God's privilege. Um, and, um, and so I think in God's blog post uh, to come full circle, um, God might, might say, figure out what your values are then figure out how to align the way you use your time with your values and then make sure that you value the time of others in the same way that you value your own time so that they too can have control over their time and make their own decisions about their values and how to spend their time. Um, so I think that might be one of the, the ways in which if God became a feminist, um, God might write that blog post. Amazing. This has been so remarkable. New sources, new material that others aren't covering. Friends, I posted in the side chat here the Amazon link um, if you'd like to uh, pick up this book. Highly recommend or her others. Um, and uh, what, what a great pitch that Professor Sarit Katan Gribbets made for our Valley Beit Midrash. If even God needs to learn Torah all the time, how much more so all of you who already know so much Torah and still need to be joining us multiple times a day. So um, you made a great pitch for us. We're gonna bring you back for our gala. We've never had a gala, but if we do, we'll bring you back. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Bethel, for your partnership. Thank you, Professor Sarika Tangrivitz. Thank you, the great Pam Bueller for, for managing everything as always. Have a great day. Thank you so much.